Hello and welcome to the Exploring the Mind series. This is a partnership between the Ann Arbor District Library and the University of Michigan Department of Psychology. Uh, today we are welcoming our special guest, Dr. Stephanie Preston. And uh, just before we get started, let me cover a couple quick housekeeping tips. First of all, if you need the restroom, if you exit this room and turn right, there are two all gender bathrooms on the left and right hand sides of the hall. If you need hearing assistance, there is hearing assistance devices that are available on the back table. And if you are interested in Dr. Preston's book, Literati Bookstore is selling that book uh, at the table outside. So you can pick up a copy when you leave. I see that some people have already taken advantage of that and done so before we got started. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Preston and her colleague, Chris Monk. Okay, all right, thank you so much for coming out. It's been two and a half years since we've been able to do this in person, so it's great. <laughs> it's a really great turnout. I'm so glad we're not doing this uh, on Zoom today and we can do this all together. Um, okay, so um, my name, as uh, Steve said, is uh, Chris Monk. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychology here at the University of Michigan and one of the, the associate chairs. So it is my honor to introduce Dr. Stephanie Preston to discuss some of her really exciting work uh, and research, and also, most importantly, her new book that's just come out. So uh, Stephanie is a professor in the Department of Psychology here at the U of M. Uh, she completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Virginia in Cognitive Science. And then she went on to receive her PhD in Behavioral Neuroscience from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and then she was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Iowa College of Medicine. And then uh, in 2005, we were fortunate enough to have her uh, join us here at the, at the University of Michigan. Um, Stephanie uses interdisciplinary approaches to understand emotion and decision-making. Within that realm, she focuses on two main questions. First, how do people process other people's emotions and how does this affect the help they offer? The second question is, how do people allocate resources like food, money, and material goods? Stephanie has published many theoretically rich and methodologically sound studies. Moreover, she has received a multitude of impressive honors and awards, uh, including grants from the Templeton Foundation and Hyundai Kia America Technical Center, as well as the University of Michigan Faculty Recognition Award. Um, the title of Stephanie's talk, as you can see, is The Altruistic Urge, Using Brain Evolution to Predict and Improve Human Helping. Here is Dr. Stephanie Preston. Thank you so much. If you don't mind, I'm going to speak without my mask because I think it will be a little too jarbled if I'm speaking and then my glasses will be fogged up, but... I'll stay a little bit back from you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful to be a part of this awesome series and um, to also, you know, herald back the in-present, in-person version is uh, such an honor. And I'm really grateful to see some familiar faces and some new ones as well. We're going to have questions and answer at the end. So if like something is terribly confusing, you can yell out during the talk, but I'll answer questions at the end. So Chris already covered this. That gives me a little more time for my final slides. I'm a professor at Michigan, and we have the Ecological Neuroscience Lab. And it's called that because it's a combination of kinds of research that I did in my background that he also talked about, where these are all species that I've studied. Um, this is a monogamous vole that takes care of its offspring and um, bonds with the uh, mate for life. This is a kangaroo rat that stores seeds in the desert. Uh, squirrels also store food. Um, and we study the decision-making process of them. These are monkeys. We studied the emotions of social interactions at Yerkes and monkeys. And chimpanzees, I wasn't as directly involved with those. I was just present and filming and doing things like that. <laughs> and my degree is in cognitive science though. So that was more about like the nature of the mind and so when you merge these together, the underlying theme I think of my work is the ways in which 
our minds are similar actually to these other species. So most research on human um, cognition and consciousness is about our uniqueness. You know, what makes us special? What are these amazing cognitive feats that we can do that other animals can't do? What, what makes us um, human in that way? But I'm actually interested in the converse of that problem. What is similar to other animals in human behavior, especially because we're not as aware that we're doing it, right? So, you know, when you do something and you have conscious awareness of it, then you have direct access into your thought pattern. Like, well, I decided to give money because I thought about this, and then I thought about that, and then I went to my spreadsheet and I figured out how much I could give, and then I filled out the envelope, right? So those are all things you're consciously aware of. But there's this emotional, motivational moment where you see the thing that requires aid, and your motivation is turned toward those people in need. What causes this kind of switch in you? And these are things I believe we share with a lot of other animals. Um, there's many people who participated in the research I'm talking about today. In particular, um, some of these colleagues here, Rachel Seidler was on the fMRI papers. Brent Stansfield is here in the audience. He was involved in the original emo Stroop task, I'll describe. Brian Vickers was a PhD student um, who did a lot of the research I've talked about on altruism. And these are just pictures of all the undergrads and the students in our lab, um, as well as Tanner is a new grad student in our area. So there's a series of sort of chapters in the talk, if you will, and we're gonna step through one at a time. Only the first couple parts are about the theory itself and where it came from, what is the inspiration for the idea. And then the charity part down is um, applications. So ways in which we've tried to apply this theory to test real world situations of people's emotional and behavioral responses. So at first I'm gonna tell you about three distinct stories that may or may not seem to have anything to do with one another, but that struck me in a very particular way and inspired me, and we'll um, explain how that happened. The first is, as I told you before, I studied at um, NIMH this caregiving behavior of rodents for their offspring. So these are um, traditional offspring behaviors. This is pup retrieval or carrying, this is licking and grooming. This is huddling over them and keeping them warm and then nursing. So these are all things that take place in the nest when um, a rodent mother, which is also called a dam, gives birth to a litter of pups. And there's actually a tremendous amount of research on this um, sequence of events and how the dams are motivated to respond to the pups in this very active way. So this one study that I was particularly enamored of was it from 1969. So you can see this has been going on for a long time. <laughs> We've been studying this response for a long time, which is probably saying a good thing about our character that we're interested in caregiving. Um, this is like a traditional Skinner box. In this version that's just from like a random website, the um, rat would see a light or hear a tone, push a lever, and then the food comes out into the cage. And in this version, there's like an electrified grid, but we don't need those for the study I'm gonna describe. Instead, in this version, there's like a little tunnel and a nest chamber next door. So what happens is the dam has just given birth to a litter. So she's got all of these hormones on board that actually change the brain and change the relationship between the neurotransmitters, the neurohormones, and the um, behavior in order to ensure this care of the pups. So what happens is the dam pushes the lever, and at first a couple of food pellets come out. So that's exciting, keep push the lever, a little bit of food comes out. But after six times, one of her pups comes out instead of the food. So she pushes the lever, and a little pup, pup comes down the chute, and it's her pup. And she picks it up in her mouth, like you saw on the previous slide, and carries it back to the nest and deposits it nice and safe and then comes back to wait for the time to push the bar again. So that happens six more times. And then they start replacing the pups with unrelated pups. So pups that do not belong to her. 
because all of the females were brought into estrus at the same time, and so they all gave birth to litters. So there's a lot of pups available, only some of which were related to her. So then they start putting unrelated pups down the chute. <laughs> so an uh, unrelated pup comes down, she picks it up, brings it back into the nest, deposits it, and returns. And this happens repeatedly. Um, and in fact, it went on for three hours. And there is a quote from the paper. I, I really like these old papers because they have a little bit more of a casual tone. And the experimenter said, the experimenters ceased the experiment because they became tired and there were no signs of the habituation of the dams. <laughs> so it's like they showed no sign of flagging motivation, right? They just kept getting the pup, bringing it back, getting the pup, bringing it back. And there was a, approximately four per minute that they were doing for three hours. Um, and, and, you know, after the original um, bar presses, it really didn't like trail off. And so this was a sign to Wilson Croft that this is a very powerful motivation. And it's interesting too, because assuming certain conditions, um, it's also the case that it doesn't have to be your own related pup, right? They kept doing it and it might take you a minute to know, oh wait, these aren't my pups anymore, but they do actually have like recognition. Um, so, they could tell by smell the distinction between their own and others' pups, but they continued to retrieve. So it's not just a thing that you would do um, for your own pups. There's another series of interesting studies we learned about in graduate school. This is Conrad Lorenz, who is from Vienna. He was the father of ethology. And he was the one that became famous for imprinting, where the duck or a goose comes out of the egg, and the first thing it sees that moves away from it, it takes to be the mother, and then it follows it thereafter. Um, so this is the ones that imprinted to him. And this is a drawing by my daughter, but that resembles a figure in one of his papers. And I did a lot of work for you guys because I was in German. <laughs> I don't speak German. So me and the Google Translate were like going back and forth for like a really long time, trying to make sure we had all these details correct. But um, what happens is this is what they call the, sorry, I can't move from the mic. <laughs> this is what they call the egg retrieval behavior. So the goose sits on the eggs to keep them warm in the nest. But if one happens to fall out, there's this patterned behavior or she puts out her neck puts it around the egg and draws it back into the nest, okay? So it's a, what they call a fixed action pattern. It's like a thing that Lorenz himself coined this term. And it, it's called a fixed action pattern because once the sequence starts, if you take the egg away, she will complete the act. So once it gets issued, it, it follows till completion, even if the egg isn't there anymore. And it doesn't have to be an egg. They did all kinds of experiments. Um, it just has to be, usually it helps if it's rounder looking and if it moves away, like it's rolling away, then it obviously activates this response. The one on the bottom right is like a giant paper mache Easter egg that they put in there that the geese pulled back into the nest or attempted to. And um, they did beer cans and skeletons and <laughs> all kinds of objects. So you can see that in the brain, there's this sequence that's activated through the giving birth to the eggs and keeping them warm, but that the sequence isn't fixed really to a very specific, specific stimulus. And so it can be activated by these other things. This is the third story. Um, in the altruism community, there's like, you know, at least 10 of us. Um, <laughs> this story is um, talked about a lot. Um, this is Wesley Autry. He was at a subway station in New York City when a young man, an adolescent, had a seizure on the, tra on the platform. And so everyone could tell that something was wrong with him because he was like leaning and swaying. And then he fell into the track. And the train is coming. And Wesley Autry jumped in. He was standing on the platform with two young daughters, which terrifies me, to be honest. He jumped in and smushed 
the boy down in between the rails because there wasn't enough time to pull him back out. And then he laid on top of him while the train went over the both of them. And they just barely missed them by one inch. It might even be a centimeter. Let's go see it. Hopefully we can watch a video. On the New York City subway, it's hard enough finding someone who will give up his seat to a stranger, let alone be willing to give up his life for one. The train was coming in like, like, like that. It happened just... 50-year-old Wesley Autry, a construction worker and Navy veteran, was standing on a subway platform with his two little girls, when right in front of them, a man started having a seizure. He kind of stumble and over his own feet and fall backwards. I see a train coming, but the train is so close. I'm like, what do I do? Wesley jumped onto the tracks and thought if he could just lie on top of the man, keep him from flailing, maybe the train would roll right over both of them. The clearance was exactly 21 inches. Wesley and the man, 20 and a half. No way the train can stop before this gentleman could get him, get him up off the tracks. So he covered him with his body and pushed him down to a point where the train wouldn't hit his head and held him down under the tracks while the train came and rolled right over the top. It gave Wesley's children the scare of their young lives. I thought he was going to get killed. And Wesley, the scare of his too. I'm like talking to him, sir, you can't move. I got two kids up here looking for their father to come back. I don't know you, you don't know me, but listen, don't panic. You know, I'm here to save you. As for the guy Wesley saved, He's 20-year-old Cameron Hollipter, and other than a few scrapes and bruises, his father says he's doing fine. Mr. Autry's instinctive and unselfish act saved our son's life. You know, the word hero gets thrown around a lot nowadays. What a better way to say it to start off the new year than to save, save a life. <laughs> nice to be reminded of what one really looks like. Steve Hartman, CBS News, New York. So you can see how striking that story is for a lot of reasons. And it's also um, very interesting. Here's like the diagram where they plotted it all out and they said there was a half an inch to spare. And there's a lot of details that from the scientific study of altruism are of interest to me. So he was a father. He had his daughters with him. He had been in the Navy and worked in construction in small spaces. So he was familiar with um, being in small spaces. And um, it was immediate problem. It would be right in front of him. And um, it was a, an immediate issue. Okay, we're going to keep returning to this theme. So when you put the three things together, I think of the commonalities. There's these commonalities across these examples that are striking to me from an altruism theory. There's a form of aid or, or a rescue. There's a, the victim is someone vulnerable who can't help themselves in that moment. It's a fast, intuitive action. There's some form of preparation or expertise involved, right? So the dams had been highly prepared by their um, hormones and by their caregiving experience in the days before to know how to do this retrieval response. Wesley Autry knew how to work in small spaces, and he was a father. He knew about you know, the vulnerability of younger people. There's minimal time for deliberation, so you don't have time for your spreadsheet. You have to like act, right? You have to um, make a very quick decision. That doesn't mean there are zero thoughts in your mind, but it's a very quick decision. And in all these cases, there's some success in the, in the act because of um, especially the preparation and expertise and the strong motivation in the moment. So these are features that, to me, are an altruistic response. So we'll define this in a minute more narrowly, but it's a specific kind of behavior, much like the pep retrieval or the egg retrieval, 
where you have to go and get somebody and bring them back to safety. Right? Like you physically have to help somebody who's vulnerable and in need, which is a situation in evolution that we faced for a long time with our offspring, right? So um, humans and most um, primates and mammals, they call altricial because they're, they don't come out of the womb ready to take care of themselves, right? So an ungulate like you know a zebra or something might like just take a few minutes to get up and walk and then is doing pretty good. <laughs> But um, the rodents, the humans, monkeys, they spend a long time nursing and being like really vulnerable and helpless. And there's nothing they can do about predation. They can't find their own food sources. So there's this extended period of time where the mother or the parents or the caregivers in different species, there's different caregivers. Obviously, it's much broader in humans. But the... Um, the act goes on for an extended period of time. So you might have a new idea, but a, a good idea that it must be sensible, right? Especially something called the altruistic urge. It's kind of like begging for complaints. <laughs> you know, like, you're like, I'm not altruistic. This is ridiculous. You know, like, <laughs> I would never want to be helpful. Like, um, so, you know, there's like good reason to assume people are not altruistic. There are, are an uncountable number of ways in which people are like not helpful. <laughs> Right now, there are people who need us, and we're not there. We're here, right? So, um, you know, people turn a blind eye. There's um, horrible cases of genocide, and we're like, well, it's not happening right here, so I'm going to, like, try not to get involved, right? Or even in the case of the subway, there are a lot of cases where people call it... Um, bystander apathy, where nobody helps, even though dozens of people were supposedly around and heard the cries of someone for help or saw somebody passed out on the street. Maybe even that same guy who was the journalist in the video does the Dateline show where they have like these gotcha events where somebody poses as somebody in need and then they film how many people walk by. Um, they have a whole show about it. <laughs> That's how common it is for us to not be helpful. So how can it be the case that we have evolved this um, strong motivation to save vulnerable individuals? Well, there is some scientific um, basis for this belief, luckily. Um, these are different brains that are more or less to scale based on um, the size. So this is a rat or a mouse brain. It's like this big. A songbird is a little bigger. And then the human brain is like a Nerf ball, you know, like a a little Nerf ball inside there. And there's a lot more convolution and the shape looks pretty different, but the inner parts are very similar. Um, so they all have a cortex and a cerebellum and a brainstem, and they have very similar areas with neurotransmitters in the inside that perform similar functions across species. So this is a diagram from Kent Barrage and Terry Robinson in uh, the psychology department on addiction. So this is a neural circuit that's involved in drug addiction. There's these components of liking drugs and wanting to get the drugs, right? They're like kind of separable components where you're like, that was delicious and I must have more, <laughs> right? They're separable. And this nucleus accumbens in particular and the prefrontal cortex are exchanging uh, opiates and dopamine to support this response. And there's a reason we study this in rodents, because the same neural circuits and neurotransmitters support our own addiction, right? Like our own um, need to have things that we find delicious and rewarding and exciting and whatever else. And it's not even the case that it has to be what is kind of ironic, because the word consumable, right? Like a drug or a drink or a food, something you evolved this system likely for, um, well, don't, <laughs> we'll talk about that later, but um, this system is involved in any kind of item that you might seek that fi you find rewarding. So social partners, attractive people, chocolate, shoes, purses, anything that you find rewarding and that you seek toward is, um, they have experiments showing it's supported by the same neural system. 
So there are distinctions in all these things across species, but they're smaller than the commonalities, right? So for example, we study the monogamous vole because it has this particular brain circuit, almost all these same brain areas are involved in bonding for life with a mate. And it involves oxytocin and vasopressin in your brain. And the number of receptors of oxytocin are much more numerous in the monogamous bull than the non-monogamous one. So there's differences. They have many more receptors for this sort of love drug, but don't call it that because <laughs> that's oversimplified. But um, there are many more receptors in species that mate for life than that don't, or that you know, care for offspring for an extended time than don't. So there's differences. And even in the nucleus that comes in rats, the receptors are very complicated. There's different kinds of dopamine and different locations where the different types of dopamine exist. But it's like you're not going to get this same function someplace totally different in another animal's brain. It's going to happen here, and it's going to involve these neurotransmitters, but the precise number and um, ways in which things happen in our plastic can differ by species. But it's very similar in humans because your brain itself evolved, right? The you know, rodents have been on the planet for 200 million years, so this fundamental brain that is capable of doing things like finding mates, foraging, protecting young, um, you know, fighting off intruders has existed for a long time and the brain expands the cortex and certain things shift a little over time, but the basic structure is, is intact, is still the same um, over time. So the cortex is like the, the thing most people care about in human behavior, right? Because they're like, well, obviously our brain is way better because it's a huge convoluted cortex, right? That it's so big, it has to fold in on itself to make room inside the skull, right? Or we have to be living outside of the womb for a long period being helpless because if our skull got any bigger, we wouldn't be able to make it out the birth canal, right? So there's this very impressive cortex. But there's a lot of work that the underlying structures do, these like medial temporal regions, that people aren't as consciously aware of, but that are still very powerful because they were needed to ensure our survival for this long period of time. Here's just another example. This is the brain of a bird. And birds are really funny because their brains look very different and they, they give slightly different names to some of the areas but research has shown them to be homologous. Homologous meaning it's the same area, the striatum here and the striatum here are the same, even if like the spatial correspondence has shifted slightly in the, the bird um, brain, literal bird brain. So there's an amygdaloid complex instead of an amygdala. There's a pallidum instead of a globus pallidum, um, but they still have the thalamus, the um, hindbrain, midbrain, cerebellum and they have something like a hippocampus, very similar to humans. So there's still all of this homology, even when they don't look as similar as say a rodent and a human. And there's also, we know, this is again a figure from Conra Conrad Lorenz, this concept which we call neoteny, which is when you resemble um, the infant-like traits that are specific to the younger version of the species. So these are adult versions, and these are younger versions, and they share in common these sort of morphological characteristics, like the head is like bigger relative to the body, it's more round, the nose is shortened, the, um, the eyes are bigger relative to the size of the face, and then um, the limbs are shorter. So there's these features that indicate that something is young which they call neotenous. And people are very attracted to these features. So um, Conrad Lorenz thought it was like, came in tandem where you find features attractive of these beings that we need to stay close to. So it's like non-accidental that we find these features of helpless babies to be very attractive and we want to be near them and like cuddle them and kiss them. You know, like people 
will walk up to pregnant women in the grocery store and like touch their stomachs or like, you know, stare at people's babies in um, carriages. And there's research showing that this um, attraction toward neotenous features, it exists in women and men and people before um, they reach sexual maturity. And also in humans, it um, can be applied to an adult face. So if you take an adult face and you like morph it to look a little bit more neotenous, people rate it as more attractive, but they also rate it as more helpless. So it's like these features carry with the characteristics we impute to infants. And we sometimes accidentally do that to people as well. And there's also what we know to be a conservation of the way our emotional systems respond. So um, there are many studies now. Historically, there was only two or three studies, but this kind of research exploded sort of uh, around the 2000s where humans and rodents feel emotionally aroused and stressed by the distress of another individual. So if you're upset, I'm upset, you know, that's like an emotional contagion, right? And this emotional contagion exists in many species, including birds, and it also promotes altruism. So they have, for example, a really cool study um, at the University of Chicago where they had rats who had been trapped in a box like this one. This is like a constraint. And the rat that's on the outside can figure out how to pull the door and release it. And it doesn't already know, it hasn't been taught. So they're just put in the, in the cage together, one that's confined and one that's not. And eventually the one that's free is walking around trying to figure out what's going on and eventually pulls up the door and frees the trapped rat. And people are saying, well, maybe it's not even altruistic, it just wanted to have the company. <laughs> it just wanted a buddy, you know, that's not altruism. But they even did studies where they left chocolate or the other animal in different compartments and it chooses to help free the other one before it goes and eats chocolate. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. And in our lab, we did a lot of these kind of studies where you put face muscle electrodes onto people's um, face and then you show them the picture of another person's happy, sad, angry face and they get the same muscles activated as they see in the face on the computer. And sometimes you're not consciously aware of it. It's subtle, but like the electrode can pick up small amounts of electrical activity. So you can see it's very reliable. This isn't one of those like fake science things <laughs> that you can only show one in a hundred times. It happens every time. It's um, as long as you're like paying attention to the stimulus. Um, so we, we evolved this capacity that we share with other species where others' emotion also makes us feel emotional, which is then kind of a, a hot motivational drive to help, right? Not just because you care about them, but it also makes you feel better, which to me is not problematic. So the altruistic response we talked about as this kind of like drawing something back, it's not all of altruism. Right, so there's as many kinds of altruism as there are pasta, and they don't all have the same <laughs> mechanisms. <laughs> um, so altruism is this broad category. Helping another individual is actually a subcategory of altruism. So doing something like making an alarm call to signal a predator is nearby is a kind of altruism a lot of species do, but it's not called, it's not considered helping, right? Or even, um, you know, let, there, are, there are a wide variety of kinds of altruism where you help another at a cost to yourself. But helping is a specific version of that, and altruistic responding is a, is a version of helping. So um, that it's based on this active offspring care, like the pup retrieval, the same neural circuit. So this neural circuit, yeah? Okay, so altruism is any time one organism assists another organism and it's currently costly in the moment to that organism. 
So like even amoeba have this like behavior where they run out of food in this environment and they grow a stalk and then the ones at the top get to go over the ledge into the new environment where there might be more food, but the ones that form the stalk die because they didn't get to go over into the new environment. So that's altruism, but they don't consider it like helping or like an alarm call is just kind of diffuse. It's not one individual to another individual. It's just like a noise I make and anybody around will realize maybe there's a hawk or a snake. Um, but like helping can come in different forms too. This is something like uh, Felix Hornikin studies where you can offer aid to somebody that's very practical and thoughtful, but you didn't have to rescue them. So one example would be like the most common altruism task in psychology is like a dictator game where I just walk up to you and I give you $10 and I say, do you want to give any of your $10 to the other person who showed up today? And they're like, okay, here's five. <laughs> so there's no reason to give the money to the other person. They don't say they have any financial need. There's nothing discussed about them having a problem. They just end up sharing the money um, in a way economists consider altruistic. So that's, again, it's not like help or an altruistic response because it's not targeted at an individual who needs aid in the moment. Whereas the out, helping is usually somebody who needed the aid, but the altruistic response is this very active phenomenon that happens under particular conditions. I'm going to list the conditions. That might help. In one second, I'll list the conditions. Um, so this is the brain circuit they've already studied extensively in other species. It doesn't really, you don't have to worry about all, <laughs> all these letters. There wasn't enough room to spell them all out. But this is that same circuit that's involved in the drug addiction um, that was on the prior slide. So there's like an approach circuit and an avoidance circuit. And so if you haven't had any offspring, if you're a rodent and you're a virgin female or you're an ma unmated male, you um, are in this withdraw circuit, which like tamps down your response to these individuals. So if you put like a pup in a cage with an unmated individual in a, in a rodent or a vole, they'll ignore it. They'll like get as far away from it as possible because it's kind of like frightening. <laughs> it's like novel and weird and they don't want to have anything to do with it. So every once in a while they try and eat it. But if they've been mated or they've given birth and these hormones are on board, um, and you can apply the hormones even to a male or a virgin female, and they will then shift into this approach response where they immediately go to the pup, sit on it, huddle it, lick it, groom it, whether it's theirs or not. Um, so there's like the avoidance and versus the approach, and there's particular known conditions that can shift you from one to the other. But you don't have to have this like surge of hormones. If you just leave a male or a virgin female for a week in the cage with the pup, they'll gradually come together, right? So the, they start off like this, and then they're like, well, I don't know, maybe it's okay. Like, how are you doing over there? And then by the end of the week, it does the exact same things because this avoidance response has habituated to the novelty. It's like more familiar. But then these are human cortical regions that we already know are interconnected with these um, midbrain areas. So your cortex is able to talk to the midbrain regions in order to apply these things we call reason, right? Like, oh, I'll jump in the train and save the guy. But then, you know, some part of you might say, oh, but my kids are here. That would be very bad if they saw me get splattered by the train. I better not, right? Like, you have the capacity to stop yourself, especially if you have time. The longer you have to decide, and most psychology experiments give you time. It's not urgent in most psychology experiments. I can't even think, I should probably think through that. I can't even think off the top of my head of one of the paradigms that's urgent, it has to be done right now. Otherwise the point is moot, right? There are kind of experiments where you can take over electric shocks for somebody who's in pain, but um, 
it doesn't quite have that same urgency. Um, wait, this is going to get Patton's question. But so there's this approach avoidance of potency that you can see in a lot of these cases, right? So the rats have obviously approaching versus avoiding pups. In maternal care, you have this transition from like not being as interested to being very interested in infants. In heroism, they have the people who act and the people who didn't, right? So we talk about a lot in my class, these heroism examples and you know, the primary factor in all these cases are like, can you swim? You know, like it almost didn't matter. Is it icy? Is it a warm day? Is the person light? Are they heavy? Is it a fast current or a less swift current? If the person can't swim, they're not going in to save the person. If they're not strong, they can't pull somebody out of a burning building, right? They know that. They can implicitly intuit whether their body is capable in the time allowed to do this response. So your motor system is very good at making those quick implicit decisions about time, speed, space, based on your own experience with your body. I see it like some of my tennis friends are here and it's kind of like you see at the US Open, somebody will hit a short drop shot and sometimes they bolt toward the ball and like half the time they get it, right? And then sometimes there's a drop shot and they don't even move. They're like, nope, not that one. <laughs> so they instantly know when the ball is struck and is coming over the net, if they're likely to be able to get there in time or not. And they don't even run in some cases and then they like go all out in others. Um, so your motor system is very good at this. Also with Kitty Genovese, people used it as an example that like, Modern urban life is terrible and society is crumbling because this poor woman was stabbed um, outside of her apartment building in the night and nobody helped. Recently, people are um, complaining that it wasn't true that nobody helped. One person did call the police. One person like yelled out but then didn't do anything. But there's still a lot of inaction and she was murdered. Um, but at the same time, I mean, if you think of the approach and the avoidance, she was screaming bloody murder in the middle of the night. I don't know very many people who are gonna rush toward a knife wielding maniac in the middle of the night, right? Like most of us don't feel confident that when we arrive, we're gonna help the situation and we're not gonna get hurt ourselves. So I don't really think it's fair to vilify people. And then people say, well, um, they didn't call the cops, but some people did. So, you know, the approach avoidance, your body is taking into account the potential danger versus success. And it's toggling this switch between responding and not responding. And it can make this decision very quickly based on expertise. So this is sort of like addressing Patty's, when do we respond? When do you have this altruistic response, this characteristic behavior that's subserved by this neural circuit? So the victim usually has to be something like a neonate. So neonates having those baby-like qualities, being vulnerable, like not being able to help itself. People always say that to adults, don't they? Like, well, I just don't know why that person doesn't get out of it themselves. You know, like, why do I have to get involved? You feel more bonded to them emotionally, or you're more likely to help. If they are distressed and an obvious need of immediate aid, you're more likely to help. And your expertise is very important, as we've been describing. You have to see that there's a possible solution that's obvious to you, but you also think you can pull it off in time, right? And you're making this quick decision based on your own expertise, and then you have the altruistic response when all of these features align. And they're not on and off switches, they're like continuous variables so sometimes somebody would be very distressed and in need who's not like a baby normally, right? But they just got injured. So like the boy who had a seizure, he's not like a baby in general, but because he was in this post seizure state and lack of consciousness, he was in great need of help, even though he wasn't like crying out, right? So like features can substitute for others and the strength of one 
can substitute when another is weak as long as the same general picture emerges. So how do we apply this to helping people in daily life? As per my usual, I'll have to go more quickly through this section. <laughs> Um, these are studies we did with Brian Vickers where you describe to people charities that have different attributes. So they're just described verbally, like in a sentence. But one of them will be like, you know, you have to rush in to help the people who are buried under the avalanche or the boaters whose boat capsized in the bay. Or it could be more preparatory, like you have to collect the donations toward the nonprofit or... It could be not an emergency at all, like we have to take care of the original constitution to make sure, you know, preserve the legacy of this document, right? So there's all these different charities in the real world, and your money goes toward different things. But people want to give money when it feels immediate. They give more money, and females always give more money than males do. And... Um, some people write papers about how this is just like a social construct, and it might be. I honestly, I haven't done like systematic research on our culture versus one where you're not enculturated for women to be helpers, right? Like America has a particular context in which women are thought of as the helpers. So that might not be the case everywhere in the world. But in every study I've ever done, women give the most money. Um, and then we did a version in the fMRI scanner where you see one of these charity descriptions. You click a button many times to earn money, and then you get to take some of your earned money, if you want, and donate it to each charity. So it's like one charity at a time. You get a little pot of money, and how much do you want to give to this charity, the next one, the next one, and um, it goes on. So then you plot all the amounts of money people gave, depending on what the charity was like, and people give the most if the aid is more heroic and immediate. But there is this weird, um, what we in science call three-way interaction, <laughs> where people give the most if it's a neonate who needs help, like a young person who needs help immediately, and I'm going to do some nurturing. And you can't, you, it's very difficult in the lab to dissociate infants and nurturance, because people naturally rate them a little higher on nurturance, even when we made them heroic, which causes this weird graph that I think Brent might have made. So the neonates get the most aid compared to adults, and then people get more money when it's more active and immediate aid to save somebody imperiled in the moment, the person who's boat capsized, right? But if it's a baby who needs help, like in the NICU who needs soothing care and like touch to keep it warm, then people are the most excited to give. And this three-way interaction, the degree that you want to help an infant who has an immediate need of your nurturance um, is correlated with areas in this anterior cingulate that's very dorsal. So it's part of the motor cortex. So this motor area of the cingulate um, is correlated not just in brain activity, but amount of gray matter for people who show this effect. So like I view it as actually kind of like a motor preparatory motivation, not just like the warm fuzzy kind. So that's another thing that distinguishes this altruistic response from something like Dan Batson is a famous psychologist who studies empathy-based altruism. And his altruism is based on warm, tender, compassionate feelings toward the other person, which do happen, right? But those are different kinds of situations. Those are times where like you have time to like soak in this sense of care and concern, you know, that sits with you and then you might offer aid subsequently. But this is more like, oh Jesus. <laughs> Well, it's a little bit like more immediate and you don't have time to feel warm, tender compassion, at least not consciously. Um, and you can apply this to other things also. So this is a study we also did with Brian Vickers and Ting Ting Lu, one of our graduate students was involved in Rachel Seidler, um, where people just decorate pretzels. And why do we do that? Because people become very quickly attached to things you give them. 
And if they're decorated pretzels, they become very attached to them, but they can tell which ones are theirs, right? So like, anyway, so <laughs> we put them in the scanner and it's a very similar paradigm where they get to push the button if they wanna save the pretzel, but at the end of the trial, it might be thrown in the garbage. So they have the opportunity to know which pretzel it is, who made it, is it likely to be thrown away, and then they put in great effort to save the ones they want to save. And they save nicer ones, but they also save their own much more than other people's. And this is activating parts of the brain that are also involved in this empathy-based altruism and this dorsal um, cingulate, um, including the insula, which is always involved in human empathy experiments. Here's another example. We went to the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and um, they have an ad campaign and they have many different ads to save children who have cancer. So if you're wondering, at this hospital, they pay for all the care. So the patients don't have to pay anything and they put the parents up in housing and um, it's a very wonderful charity, but we presented this kind of view to them of what kinds of things activate people's altruistic response. And this is obviously already a very sympathetic character, right? Like people already feel very bad for children that have cancer because there's like a mismatch between this beautiful neoteny and like the situation that they're in. But they just added this kind of motor component to the Spanish ad where the people are typing in the phone number on the ad instead of not showing the part where they actually do the act. And the giving gave up by, went up by like 14% just with this small change to the format of the ad, which had the actual act primed for people. And we try now, we're trying to apply this to the earth and why don't people want to save the earth, right? Like we are in a climate crisis and mostly people don't care. <laughs> or they have like waves of concern, but then, you know, like it passes. Um, so I have an intuition from my cognitive science days that the earth itself isn't very vulnerable seeming, right? It's like a giant rock. It's a timeless planet. Like it doesn't seem like something we need to save. It doesn't have any of these vulnerable features. So we asked people to just give words to describe the earth without giving them any information. And these are the most popular ones, and I put in red ones that are less likely to promote a response. So, you know, these campaigns themselves might be a little misdirected. And then we figure out all these different ways that people think of the Earth. They have many different associations, and yours are different from mine. We, we're, you know, aware of many of these different ones, but we hold them to different degrees. So, like, the fact that the climate is warming is something that might be in some people's minds, but not others, right? Or, you know, how beautiful it is to see a sunrise is very important to some people and not others, even if we're all aware of the fact. So you can clump people based on the degree that they see the earth as vulnerable or they feel impassive to the destruction of the earth. So impassive people see these particular images, these very specific ones, and this paper just came out like this past week. Um, and they're like, eh, it's not that bad. You know, so if you have a negative to positive scale with like a neutral point, they're like, eh, I mean, I can see how it's bad, but like I'm not that upset about it. Whereas some people are all the way here in the negative, like I feel very bad looking at these images. And then other people are saying the earth is at risk, it's vulnerable, it's fragile, it needs our help, it's distressed, it's depleted. When we use it, there's a cost. So these are inversely correlated. So the more you're impassive about the earth's destruction, the less vulnerable you see the earth and vice versa. And those are different people also statistically. Um, so liberals are more likely to see the earth as vulnerable and conservatives are more impassive. Males are more impassive. Traditionally, religious people are more impassive. And there's also this kind of trait measure of empathy. Like, do you feel sad when you see a person in distress? Um, not that much. And yes. So, you know, 
What causes people to be impassive? What causes them to not care? Yeah? SDS. Yeah, so um, th these might, I don't know what, how stable these are, but um, socioeconomic status. Okay. So it's kind of like income and um, job level. It, this one is, is using this ladder that some people know about. So these impassive people aren't just not feeling that bad about these images. They also don't feel that very bad if they see children crying. And I thought, well, if they're more conservative and they're more male, they're more religious, maybe they just care about different things. You know, we have to provide examples of things they might care about. So, you know, we found soldiers, injured, injured athletes, officers who are in distress, um, car accident um, scenes, and they don't feel as bad about those either. <laughs> but it's not just negative things, lest you think they're heartless. It's not just negative things. They're also not as excited as we are to see a happy, smiling baby. They don't think these um, cute little animals are quite as cute as one might. And even things that don't have anything to do with other people's suffering or happiness. Money, chocolate, ice cream. They're also like, yeah, I mean, those are good, but it's not... I'm not as excited as you are. Um, but their emotion, their, their ability to detect others' emotion correctly is intact. This is the um, task that Brent and I um, worked on a long time ago, where you have a face that does, does or does not match the word. So in this case, he's sad, but the word's happy. And you're not supposed to look at the face. You're only supposed to look at the word. So you characterize this word, and it messes up your response if the face in the back doesn't match. You do better if the face matches. If it's neutral, you're in the middle. And if it mismatches, it slows you down, meaning you correctly intuit this as a non-happy face. And they are perfectly normal at this. So they're getting the information in, let's say, with a person but um, some indication was that they suppressed the emotion after the fact. So they reported on a survey that they use more suppression of emotion, like to hold it in. And they say they feel less emotion in daily life, they experience less emotion, they express less on their face. So any kind of questionnaire you could give them about emotion, expressivity, positive, negative, it was just a little lower, significantly a little lower. So we tried to make different ads for these people. And consciously, this is where the conscious versus less conscious aspect comes in. They like this religious awe ad that we made for the conservative religious people. And they want to share it on social media more than the poor polar bear on the ice floe. Um, but they actually donate more to the ones we designed for the liberals who see the earth as vulnerable. So if you can pull out this vulnerability, even if it doesn't match your brand and you're not going to tell people about it and you don't want to say it's done a good job, you actually end up donating more money to it. Um, we've applied this to monarch butterflies, which people also help monarch butterflies more. This was an environmental defense fund study where like 500 or 700 people had written stories about why you know, they care about the monarch butterfly and they sent them into the Environmental Defense Fund. And then they wanted to figure out like, why were people so excited about this? And people who know more about butterflies and their part in the ecosystem, and they had had personal experience with them in the yard or a classroom, were more likely to be engaged by this. And um, this is kind of interesting. You don't have to read these individual things, but females also were much more likely to report these attributes of um, monarch butterflies, but you had to have money to be doing something about it, right? Like you have to be a homeowner to plant milkweed and you have to have money to be a homeowner, right? If you have been um, raising monarchs or you've been planting milkweed, you're working to save them, you are going to see their mass migration on the West Coast, these are things associated with wealth and giving to the EDF over, over a lifetime. 
but um, this kind of like warm and cozy care for the butterflies as a concept is more associated with women. We have done conservation studies. This is one that Bridget Bly in the audience worked with us on, where do you want to help more? Like these attributes, if it's not a person, these are wild animals, but then there's domestic animals, there's people. Um, so there's all these different kinds of species you might want to contribute to. How do people make these choices? And it turns out that, you know, like the theory, people help cute things that are familiar and in need, no matter what kind of species it is. Those attributes predict wanting to donate money on the trial to the individual, the species. But wild animals like, you know, the African megafauna, they can be powerful and beautiful, which isn't the case of like, you know, kittens and puppies and babies, you know, like things that are domestically available that you might feel sad for aren't powerful and beautiful the way like an elephant is or a giraffe. So if it's a person um, or like a domestic animal, you would help it more if it, you felt similar to it, which isn't obviously the case with an elephant. So the attributes can trade off, but this like feeling of like love and amazement um, went across studies. So the monarch butterfly, these wild animals that people donated money to conserve, when they have this sense of awe and beauty and wonder, um, then they were more likely to give. And we even have some studies with the Hyundai Corporation applying this. And we give the people these studies where they look at a picture of a car. Do you see it flash? <laughs> so that's how long you have to look at the car. And then you have to say if it looks safe or risky, if you think it looks pleasant or unpleasant. And people see cars as like smiling, you know? And so the grill of a car can have a smile to some degree or not. And people view the ones that look smiling like the, um, as very pleasant but unsafe because these are more like smaller, rounder cars that people like, but they don't think they're safe, right? So it's not like the big SUV is like, in contrast, you wanna be taken care of by the Escalade, <laughs> but you take care of the Beetle. Um, so anyway, we are caregiving social mammals. We bond with other individuals and even with objects and foods, and we want to protect things that we encounter and, feel bonded with. We're highly motivated by stimuli that are like infants. We have this empathic emotion where we share in the distress of others at this very physiological level. We have this kind of opponency in the brain and in our behavior between avoiding acting and approaching, which can distinguish between when people are heroic versus apathetic because they feel this confidence they can make this quick and implicit decision to act when they know what to do and it's clear and they're motivated by these prior features. And so we want to be able to extend this research to be able to help things like the earth, which doesn't appear yet to inspire people quite enough. So maybe we can do something about that. Um, learn more here <laughs> by buying this book. <laughs> and they have it on Amazon. Thank you so much.